So let's begin by imagining what would happen if our blood vessel in our cardiovascular system ruptures. So when a blood vessel ruptures, blood will begin to move from a high pressure to low pressure from the inside of the blood vessel to the outside surrounding tissue surrounding extracellular matrix. Now, if that rupture is not sealed off, if it is not repaired in any way, then the leaking of that blood would continue. And what that means is our capillaries in our body would expand, they would open up, and more blood would collect in those capillaries. And this is known as the pooling of blood. And as a result of the pooling of blood in our capillaries, our pressure, the blood pressure would drop and this would lead to a medical condition known as shock. And shock can be lethal, it can actually cause death. Now, because our blood vessels rupture constantly in our body, our body has a way to actually repair these ruptures in our blood vessel. And the process by which our body repairs these ruptures is known as the blood clotting cascade. So, an important property of our blood is its ability to coagulate. And what that means is to form these clumps we call blood clots and these blood clots can bind to these ruptures, aggregate along the ruptures, and they can seal off that rupture in the blood vessel, and this prevents the leakage of our blood out of that blood vessel. So this process of coagulation, the process of forming these blood clots that seal off that rupture is known as the blood clotting cascade. Now, what exactly is the blood clotting cascade? Well, it's nothing more than a serious of protein interactions and enzyme interactions that ultimately lead to the formation of these, ch uh, uh, these clumps of molecules we call blood clots. And these blood clots attach to and aggregate along that rupture on the blood vessel and that creates a watertight seal that prevents the movement of blood out of that blood vessel and that ultimately prevents the medical condition we call shock. It prevents the person from going into shock. Now let's begin by taking a look at the following illustration. So in this lecture we're actually going to discuss what the blood clotting cascade is and what the proteins are that are involved in this cascade. So let's begin by imagining that we're inside a blood vessel. So this is the endothelial, uh, endothelium of one side and this is the endothelium of the other side. We're essentially taking a cross section of our blood vessel. Now this is is the outside portion of the blood vessel, it's the surrounding tissue, it's the extracellular matrix outside the blood vessel, and this is the inside portion, the lumen of our blood vessel. Now, the first thing we should notice about our blood clotting cascade is all these proteins involved within this cascade are found inside the blood plasma. So they are circulating inside that blood plasma. And anytime we have a rupture that takes place, because these are found inside the blood plasma, they are ready to be activated and they are ready to basically form those blood clots. Now, the second thing we should notice is it looks rather complicated and that's because we have over a dozen different types of enzymes and proteins involved in the process of the blood clotting cascade. So the rather difficult aspect about this cascade is remembering the different types of enzymes and how they interact with one another to form these blood clots. So to make things easier, let's actually divide our process into three different processes. So generally speaking, we can divide the blood clotting cascade into three processes. The first two processes or the, two, the first two pathways are known as the extrinsic 
pathway and the intrinsic pathway. Now, the extrinsic pathway is shown in black with these black arrows and the intrinsic pathway is shown with the blue arrows. Now, notice that the black arrows ultimately converge with the blue arrows at this particular location where we designated with the star. And so actually the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway do converge at a single point and then they go on to form the final pathway known as the final common pathway or simply the final pathway. So this is shown with the red arrow. So let's begin by describing the quick acting pathway, the extrinsic pathway, and this is shown by these black arrows. So question number one is, how exactly do we initiate what begins the extrinsic pathway? Well, let's suppose somehow this endothelial cell ruptures. So we have a hole that forms in the membrane and that allows the blood to move from the lumen side and into the outside the tissue area down its pressure gradient from a high pressure to a low pressure. Now, as soon as this endothelial cell is damaged, it will expose a special glycoprotein membrane known as TF which stands for tissue factor. Now, this glycoprotein wasn't there before. It's exposed only when we have this damaging taking place when the endothelial cell is ruptured. Now, remember, we have all these other proteins floating around in close proximity. And as soon as the tissue factor is exposed on the membrane, what happens is another active form of another enzyme known as factor 7 goes on and binds onto the tissue factor to form a dimer protein complex that now consists of two subunits known as tissue factor complex 7. So TF7 is basically this dimer protein complex that we form as soon as the rupturing process takes place. Now, once we form the TF7 complex, this dimer protein, this, be uh, this becomes a serine protease. And what that means is it goes on to activate other enzymes by cleaving them at specific amino acids on their amino acid sequence. Now, the TF7 complex has two different proteins that it readily activates. We have protein factor 9 and protein factor factor 10 and notice that protein factor 9 when it's activated it goes on to activate some more of 10 and this is an amplification process it's a process by which we amplify the amount of 10 that is formed because ultimately it's this 10 that will go on to form blood clots as we'll see in just a moment so once again the extrinsic pathway consists of these steps and it's a a quick acting pathway it reacts quickly to this rupturing within our blood uh, within our endothelial cell so when the blood vessel ruptures it exposes a membrane glycoprotein on the damaged cell called the tissue factor TF which is actually attached to the membrane of that cell. Now TF binds to the active form of protein factor 7 found in close proximity forming a dimer protein complex, TF7. This protein is a complex that is a serine protease. And now an inactive form of 10 can come close to this complex and the complex basically lyses this or activates this inactive form in, into its active form. And the same thing is done with number nine, protein factor nine. And protein factor nine goes on and activates Activate some more of factor 10. So this is extrinsic pathway. What about the intrinsic pathway? Well, the intrinsic pathway is a bit more slow acting than the extrinsic pathway. And that's why we differentiate them. So now let's begin uh, how Let's begin by basically describing how the intrinsic pathway is initiated. 
Well, once again, as soon as the rupturing process takes place, we expose the blood vessel to the outside tissue. And this outside tissue is composed of collagen fibers, collagen protein fibers. Now, as soon as the inactive version of protein factor 12 is exposed to the collagen in that extracellular matrix, it is activated into the active version of factor 12. And protein factor 12 then goes on and activates another protein, protein factor 11. And the protein factor 11, when it's activated, it goes on to activate that same protein factor 9 that we dealt with in the, in the extrinsic pathway. Now, once 9 is activated, once again, it goes on and activates 10. So we see the underlying reason why we have two, the, uh, these two different processes is so that we have more pathways by which we can form more of number 10 because once again, it's the number 10 that will combine with the factor five to form a dimer complex that will go on and ultimately lead to the formation of our blood clot. So we have these two pathways the extrinsic and the intrinsic that eventually create many of these separate pathways that amplify the number of these complexes that we form and once they converge this complex goes on and forms our blood clots as we'll see in just a moment so let's uh, once again let's review the intrinsic pathway so when blood vessel ruptures inactive protein factor 12 is exposed to the collagen in the tissue surrounding our blood vessel and this activates factor 12. Now activated factor 12 is also a serum protease and it goes on and cleaves our factor 11 and activates factor 11 which then goes on to activate factor 9. So this one right here which goes on to activate factor 10. Now let's move on to our converging final common pathway, which begins in this area. So basically, as soon as the extrinsic and the intrinsic pathway activates as much 10 as possible, that factor 10 will go on and combine with factor 5 protein, and that will form a dimer complex we call prothrombinase and we'll see why we call it prothrombinase in just a moment we call it this because it goes on to activate prothrombin into its active form known as thrombin and once again it's important to keep in mind that all these enzymes are circulating in close proximity they are found floating around inside our blood now as soon as we form thrombin thrombin goes three different ways. It does three important things. It basically calls upon uh, platelets. Now platelets are these pieces of megakaryocytes that are also used to form that mesh-like network of blood clots that creates that seal and prevents that movement of liquid of blood out of that blood vessel. So thrombin calls upon our platelets and by the way prothrombin is formed in the liver it's released by the liver cells into our blood so it circulates within our blood and it's activated by this complex prothrombinase so once we form thrombin it calls upon platelets it also activates another fiber protein known as fibrinogen and fibrinogen basically is activated into fibrin so fibrin is the active form of fibrinogen which is activated by thrombin and it's Fi uh, and it's fibrin that actually binds together to form that mesh-like network within our rupture and that seals off that rupture. So basically the fibrin um, with the help of this protein factor 13, which is also activated by thrombin, the fibrin can form these covalent bonds between other adjacent fibrin uh, proteins, and so we eventually form these blood clots. So 
thrombin not only activates platelets and calls upon platelets, it also forms fibrin and it activates factor 13 that is needed to form the covalent bonds between many of these adjacent fibrin that lie along that rupture. So we see that the final pathway consists of the following. When factor 10 is activated by either the extrinsic or the intrinsic pathway, it combines with factor 5 to form a dimer complex we call prothrombinase. And it's prothrombinase, which is also a protease enzyme that activates prothrombin in our blood and turns it into the active form called thrombin. And thrombin does three things. It activates our platelets. It calls upon these platelets. It activates fibrinogen into fibrin and it activates factor 13 that is needed to basically covalently bond these fibrin along that rupture to form that mesh-like network of proteins that seals off that rupture and prevents the movement of blood out of that blood vessel and ultimately prevents the person from going into shock. Now, the final part that I'd like to briefly talk about and maybe focus more on, uh, on in the next lecture are these green arrows. So what the green arrows represent are amplification mechanisms, so positive feedback mechanisms. The thrombin not only calls upon platelets, activates the fibrin, and activates factor 13, but it also positively, via a positive feedback mechanism, activates more of this complex, activates factor 5 to combine